people who are still joining, but I'm going to go ahead and get started to be respectful of AS time. We really greatly appreciate joining us this afternoon. And um, so welcome everybody to um, our monthly race and equity meeting, working race and equity working group meeting. And um, for those of you who are new to this ongoing dialogue with our um, folks who are interested in this very important work to confront racism in business. That's kind of the overarching theme for um, the, the mission of the work that we do. The working group was created to address um, the inequities in the economic and social construct of the US and to hold our legislators accountable to social and economic justice. So we collaborate with ASBC's policy team to gather support on issues that have a disparate impact on minority communities and minority owned businesses and representatives of organizations that serve communities of color on issues such as access to capital, which is always critical, income inequality, criminal justice reform, economic development opportunities, a clean environment, which you know um, disproportionately impacts um, the um, BIPOC communities and responsible workplace. These are high priorities and we've got six tracks. And the six tracks are protecting the election and we know we all know how important that is now, given what we've just gone through, where we almost lost our democracy. Um, and it was—I I just have to give this anecdote. This morning, I was listening to Anand Jirharadas, and on the um, morning show with with Joe Scarborough and the others, and talking about um, you know our democracy and and the, you know how you know our our constitution held up and the justice system held up and legislators held up and that's how, you know, we kind of, you know, but the checks and balances and those systems are fractured. And I wanted to, I was screaming at the TV and I'm going, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, it's the people. The people held, held the, the country accountable. It's the people. We are the democracy that, that made sure that Biden got elected. And that always gets left out. You know, it's always, you know, you know, looking at, uh, you know, the government and legislators and stuff, but it's us, it's we, the people. And we the people won. So um, I'm very fired up about that. Anyway, so another one of our tracks is community investment, confronting racism on a local level, policing and federal policies, investor responsibility, and racism in the food system. And so today, our conversation bridges a couple of these topics, as you will hear. And after we hear from our guests, we're going to have a Q&A from all of you. And then Thomas Oppel, who's our executive vice president at ASBC, is going to update you on our current work at ASBC, and um, you know we'll we'll have a lead a dialogue for an ultimate takeaway on what is it that get grabs your attention or leverages whatever your skills asset work that you're currently working on that we can all support one another and um, and support the work of uh, our Congress, especially Ayanna Presley's office, and with that. Um, let me introduce Aya Ibrahim, who serves as the Economic Policy Advisor for Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, focusing on banking, tech, and civil liberties issues. As the Congresswoman's liaison to the House Financial Services Committee, Aya has played a critical role in efforts to reform the credit reporting system, expand the social safety net, and advocate for greater equity in federal programming and responses. And prior to joining Congresswoman Presley's, Congresswoman Presley's team, Aya support, Aya, is it A or Aya? Aya. Aya supported the election of diverse candidates at the state and local level before moving to federal work on financial services and technology policy. Um, Aya is phenomenal. We, we <laughs> love her at ASBC because she's just so dynamic and so smart and so um, energetic. And so, Aya, we're going to turn it over to you. And so tell us what you're working on and, and what you want to share with us today from uh, Congresswoman Presley. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for, for the introduction. And I just have to say that the, the feeling, the love is very much mutual. Um, you guys have been such incredible partners on so much of the work that we have been um, pushing through over the last year and very excited about you know, continued partnership into the new Congress and the new administration. Um, you know, hopeful 
for a lot of sort of our, our priorities and um, excited to see what we, what we can get done. So, you know, on that front, uh, I think that a lot of the work and um, priorities, sort of how we're sorting through that, we have the, the short term, right? How do we ensure a, a just and equitable recovery? How do we provide people relief uh, as quickly and as robustly as possible? The Congresswoman, you know, a constant refrain of hers is uh, the solutions have to meet the scale and scope of the hurt that people are experiencing. And as I'm sure folks have noticed following along with um, discussions of the stimulus negotiations is that it doesn't seem like the solutions being offered are on par with the, um, you know, acute pain that people are feeling. When you have families who are $6,000, average family, I think is almost $6,000 behind on rent, um, a lot of people are turning to, to their credit cards to be able to pay rent. You cannot offer folks a $600 check and think that that is going to cover what it is that they've accumulated in terms of, of debt over the last, you know, when did we pass, uh, eight months since, since CARES. And, you know, when we initially sort of uh, put that forward, the idea is this is the first of, of many because this is an ongoing crisis and so the response should be ongoing and it should reflect any changes in the circumstances of this, you know, these dual economic and public health crises. Uh, unfortunately, that, that has not been the case. And so a major priority, again, has just been robust universal recurring payments for folks because one that ensures that everybody has enough money in their pocket to meet all their financial obligation. It's great just from a stability perspective. It's easy to do. And more importantly, there is that additional stimulating effect, right? That money means that people can go out and on order, they can order takeout, they can still shop, you know, businesses that depend on, on you know, having these customers, these customers now have money to spend. So that has been a major fight and it seems like we will be able to get some money for those payments into, into this negotiated bill. Um, but, but moving forward, it's in, in the next crisis, what are the, the permanent structural reforms that we're making so that the next time we have some sort of downturn, there is a better cushion. So it's things like you know, uh, expanded paid leave policies and making those changes to UI, you know, we added the, the additional money and we add, we opened up eligibility or made more folks eligible. That should just be an always thing, right? What we're realizing in this cri crisis is that our social safety net is lacking. People are shocked by how stingy, honestly, a lot of the federal supports are. And so now that, now that everyone sees what it is, then moving forward, we can't keep patching up something that is inherently inadequate. Um, and so in thinking about expanding that social safety net and about priorities going into the next Congress, I mean, a couple of the things that we are really going to continue fighting for, the Congresswoman's, um, her baby bonds bill. So this is, you know, a proposal to provide all children born in, in the U.S. with a, a seed account, a seed investment account, continue to add to it over the years. And it's, um, one method of closing the, the racial wealth gap is based on a proposal by, by Dr. Derek Hamilton and Sandy Darity and a few others. And so that is something that, that we are going to uh, reintroduce and push for in the next Congress. Um, and it was something that was included in the Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force recommendation. So we're hopeful that there will, the administration will be receptive to some form of a program like Baby Bonds. Um, you know, uh, other issues, things like a federal job guarantee, things like um, uh, robust investment in, in housing infrastructure. So treating housing as infrastructure and critical infrastructure at that, and then funding it and resourcing it and uh, just giving it the time and consideration that it, that it deserves. For too long, housing has been uh, an afterthought. We have, gener we have a generation of renters now um, after the financial crisis, black homeowners particularly, I mean, they were crushed by, by the crisis and many lost their homes. Black and Latino homeowners lost their homes. And what ended up happening is we, now the majority of black Americans are renters, whereas prior to the crisis, they were homeowners. So how do we reverse those trends? And again, how do we help folks 
how do we make folks more resilient to any kind of economic instability or or downturn, right? So that you the the economy can't be on the up always, right? There are naturally cycles. But when there is that downturn, how do we make sure that people are okay and that they are taken care of? So things like automatic stabilizers again, um, just being able to get money to people as quickly as possible. Um, um, making some of the changes to to SNAP and other social services permanent, right? We should be providing people more than a dollar and thirty cents per meal per person. That is, that's that's no way to provide a healthy, well-rounded meal to to anyone. Um, we shouldn't be requiring people to have to make the food themselves. Like you should be able to buy hot food with SNAP. People are working one, two, three jobs. I mean what we need is policy that reflects people's life experiences. Um, and then on the small business front, obviously the Saving Our Street Act, the Congresswoman will continue pushing for that, for um, you know, uh, grants for the smallest of our businesses with an emphasis on minority and women-owned businesses. So um, that's you know sort of my spiel. Uh, I'm sure there are some things that, that I've missed, but just high level, what we're hoping to get through um, more in the short term, and then how we're thinking about things moving forward. Um, oh, and then on the criminal uh, justice reform piece, because I know we've spoken about that previously, the Ending Qualified Immunity Act, that is something the Congresswoman plans to reintroduce. Um, she's also been very vocal around the uh, death penalty and has a bill to abolish the death penalty, so she will be reintroducing that. Um, and then just generally her People's Justice Guarantee Framework, which again emphasizes that intersection of economic justice and criminal justice reform. Um, how, you know, at the end of the day, so much of this crisis is because we continue to criminalize the same poverty that we create. Well, thank you for, for that. That's, that's an incredible agenda and excited to see that there's a focus on agenda that reflects the true life experiences of, of, of people who are, you know, what it was, the statistics is something like in the past six months, 11 million people have, have gone into poverty. We're, at, we're in a crisis mode. So there really needs to be some aggressive, you know, actions taken immediately to help resolve those issues to, 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 to save, you know, to save the country basically. So, um, but I, this, I want this to be a, a conversation with everybody. And, and since we have a, a small enough group that I'm going to open it up and allow people to ask their own question. I know Rose has been firing up the Q&A and the chat with burning questions. So Rose, you want to unmute yourself and, and speak directly to the group and ask your question? Thank you so much, Mary. And thank you, everyone. And thank you, Aya, for Aya, rather, for the um, uh, really a uh, brief digest on the exciting programs that the Congresswoman is um, uh, putting forth, especially the baby bonds. That is a indeed uh, a one step toward erasing or closing the uh, racial uh, wealth and income gap. And so the first question that I have is, I love all the uh, um, initiatives and policies that the Congresswoman is putting forth as well as you know the really excited that in the new congress uh, the squad is going to be increased with uh, uh, congresswoman elect bush and congressman elect uh, jamal bowman uh, so my question is more on the tactic side in um in helping get the uh, or uh, all these policies even uh, on the first step of getting on the house floor uh, is, is the squad and the squad plus uh, going to employ some of the tactics that uh, made the Tea Party successful in bending um, Boehner and the uh, Republican leadership to uh, give a nod to their initiatives? Thank you, Rose. Um, that's a, a great question. Um, I would start by saying that getting to the floor having your bill on the floor that's the end of the work almost um the hard part is you know getting it to be taken up by committee having committee voted out and then have it be something that they're willing to consider on the floor so a lot of the work 
most of the work actually happens before something comes up for for a vote. And so, you know, in terms of of tactics, I don't want to get ahead of, you know, what what may be or or what um, you know the the members are thinking. I can't speak. I can't speak for them. What I can say is that our priority always is to be as as honest and and to speak with as much moral clarity about these issues as we can, right? And to make it clear to people what it actually is that we're that we're debating. Um, you know, I've found at least with uh, a lot of financial services policy and economic policy, there's a lot of jargon. There's a lot of um, terms of art, and sometimes that can muddy the water on what the central debate is. And so, what we always want to do is bring it back to to people and what it means for for people. And I think in and of that in and of itself is is a tool that helps reshape the debate and um, can result in or can produce different results than might than we might have otherwise. I think that. The, these members again speak with such clarity around around these issues, so that folks really know what it is that we are are trying to to accomplish and to get done. Um, but you know, again, I think that we continue to push push for the good ideas, and we continue to uh, you know try and build consensus and get buy in from from folks across the caucus, and then you know make progress that way. Marianne, might I just have a quick follow up, if sure. I may? Yeah, please. Okay, thank you. So, Aya, um, uh, to follow that up with the work, uh, uh, really the bulk of the work uh, entailed in the uh, before the uh, um, policy gets to the floor. My question is for us responsible business leaders who are members of ASBC, and uh, for me, I'm also a member of the B Corp community. How can we get responsible business leaders to support the work that goes on behind the, the, the scenes when it's such as more important that, that, that the crucial moment where um, might any of our contributions uh, help sway the policy to, towards getting to the floor at all? And, and in, in what manner can we help? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think what it comes down to is your representatives hearing from you, from businesses as constituents, right? And particularly as businesses, I mean, you're operating in that in that district is so so important. You are not just um, you are constituents, but you are also job creators. You know, you are employers, and members listen to that. Right, and so it's it's about lobbying the representatives in the places that that you are and making clear that this that this is important. So that's sort of on the individual, and then collectively, again, it's reaching out to to leadership. It's reach, uh, you know, if it's um, a bill relevant or an issue relevant to a particular subcommittee, so that that chair reaching out to the the chair staff and making it clear that you all are paying attention that you are invested in certain outcomes, that you would like to see certain outcomes, you want things to be considered, and that um, you know there are support for some of these more progressive policies. Members are always hearing from the chamber, right? So they need to be hearing from organizations like yours as often, if not more often, than, than the chamber and you know, similar organizations whose uh, interests and priorities are not necessarily in line with, with yours. Um, and who are often already pretty well represented. Thank you for that, Aya. And, and actually, Rose, you that was the perfect follow-up question. I was gonna ask her the same thing because for some of the people on the call may not understand what it, what it means to be able to support um, you know, some legislation, like how, how does that even happen? And so, Aya, so thank you for kind of clarifying that it's, it's being in touch with your local legislators and letting them know what you care about. And, and so, and I'm, that's usually done through anything from text messages to phone calls, to letters, to how, whatever means necessary, right? And then hearing from everyone as often as possible. And to your point, I love that you mentioned that to do it more often than, than the, the, the chamber because their voice, their power um, speaks volumes, our power is in our aggregate voice, right? So thank you. 
Um, does anyone else have a, a question for a oh, representative rep? Oh, nice and welcome. Glad you could join us. You're on mute. Thank you very much. This is uh, this is a great honor. I'm, I'm glad to make this call. I'm actually about to speak with the governor of Pennsylvania on a similar issue. And uh, um, I'm really interested as a, a state lawmaker in Pennsylvania representing the bluest district in the Commonwealth about uh, the, the confluence of uh, social impact, um, economic justice and entrepreneurship. Um, that's my background before I took office. Um, teaching and writing about social entrepreneurship through the lens of structural inequality. And I just wanted to lend my, my staff and my, my, my own personal and uh, professional experiences for the benefit of the council and this working group, uh, particularly as it might relate to helping federal policy, but also advocating in our state legislatures that are so important, um, working on the state and federal level together among progressive minded policy shapers. So um, I, I just wanted to, to thank you for, for having this, this forum. I have to run, but I, I wanna be a resource for, for anyone I, I, I can be. Oh, well, thank you for, for joining us. And I know that you have to run, but we'll welcome you back and, and we'll allow you the opportunity to lead a conversation to tell us more about what you're doing and let all of our members understand how we can support you and in, in, in your efforts. We're all in this together. Thank you, I'm, I'm very honored. Yeah, nice to meet you, Representative. Thank, Thank you for you. your work. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you. And then Rose, I also want to mention to the, to the uh, audience here that Rose is our newest board member at the American Sustainable Business Council. Yay! We're so happy to have you. And I saw Timothy walking around in the back, tell him I said, hello, and stay out the picture, right? And he was just trying to get some screen time. I know, I know. <laughs> so- Thank you, Marianne. Uh, <laughs> um, does anyone else have a question for Aya? Steve Blessman, I see, your, I see you on the screen. At least unmute to say hello. Hello, do I do anything to appear? Or well, is it just gonna be that photo of me? Well, do, do you have to turn on your video. Okay, so let me do that. Share screen, right? No, no sir. No, you start down video. The, start start video. video, there you go. Start video. There you are. Oh, there we go. <laughs> well, I'm... Uh, just honored to be on this call. By the way, I don't know if Chris is still on the call, but uh, we happen to know Chris Rabb, who was just uh, on there uh, two minutes ago and know his brother and his, uh, his family. And uh, so it's kind of interesting uh, that there's a group of us that all seem to know each other. Um, I just here to support the efforts of American um, Sustainable Business Council and the um, uh, uh, connection that we have with uh, Social Venture Circle, Mary Ann's leadership and uh, Rose's uh, hard work. And I'm mostly here to listen and learn. Thank you. Well, we're delighted to have you. And just for everyone, to, just a little anecdote. I am here with you today my journey began with Stephen Blessman. So Stephen Blessman is the one that introduced me to this entire community of the social venture network and the circle. And so I would not be here for, it wasn't for that man in the middle of the screen. So thank you very much, Stephen. This has been, um, you know, quite wonderful opportunity to be on this very special journey with this very important work. Um, so um, are there any, anybody else? <laughs> yes, we do love Steve. <laughs> That um, uh, so I, uh, I wanted to answer a, a question from Eileen, which I think is just so important. And so I hope she doesn't mind me um, responding to the, the whole group, but she asked, um, you know, how do we pri prioritize these solutions when all of these issues are important? And so I'm just gonna go back to something my boss said this week, actually, um, in, a, in, a, in a conversation with, with a few other folks. And it was essentially, you know, only when we are pushing for things for people, sort of, you know, these progressive policies are we asked to prioritize, right? But she said, you know, 
we're going to be greedy. We want, we want all of it. We want student debt cancellation and we want to cancel rent and mortgages for the, you know, the duration of this crisis or ensure that people are able to stay in their homes. We want to provide people these stimulus checks. We want to ensure that everyone really, really has a shot. So there is sometimes a, a scarcity mindset that sets in that we can only do so much, but it's like a trick the devil played, right? There, we can only do as much as we, as we believe and are willing to do the work to get done. And, you know, when it comes to certain, you know, interest groups, you know, corporate interests, banks, whoever it might be, they're never really prioritizing their ass. In the same way that that others are asking for everything when it comes to providing for everyday working people and families, we should be asking for all of it too. Um, and so I don't I don't know if that's the 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 more stri strategic answer though. I feel like that that should be the strategy. We ask for all of it, and we continue to ask for all of it because people deserve all of it. And so we should not be compromising with ourselves before we're even out there um, fighting. Hashtag all of it. All of it. Hashtag all of it. <laughs> so we have a, another question from Brett, who says he's curious about stimulus efforts to support the ecosystems that lift up BIPOC businesses in cities across the country. Uh, so, uh, you know, in terms of the, the businesses, the Businesses directly, um, we or the Congresswoman, uh, along with Senator Harris, had again introduced the Saving Our, Our Street Act, which would provide um, small businesses with grants of up to $250,000, um, with a 75% set aside for businesses, uh, particularly for minority and women owned businesses, other businesses um, owned by, you know, uh, marginalized folks. Uh, but, uh, you know, outside of that, the overall fight for robust recurring um, payments that will do that will go very far in supporting these communities, because, again, we're making sure that everyone has enough money in their pockets to not only meet their their financial obligations, but there's money left over that they can spend back into their local economies. And we know you know, that there's obviously a lot of overlap between the most diverse communities and the communities hardest hit by the virus and then subsequently the economic fallout from the virus. And so it'll be those communities that benefit most from these direct payments that we, we should be getting out to people ASAP. So one of the things that is, sounds like um, a conundrum to me, I, I, it, I'm, you know, this, these $600 stimulus checks, which are it's absolutely insufficient. And, you know, so, so simultaneously, you know, there, there's the, the money that they're talking about giving to businesses to save our streets or whatever other programs. But if people can't afford to shop, if people can't afford to, to you know, to, to support business community because, you know, they're just trying to pay, you know, not get evicted from their home. I, I don't, I don't, it seems really insidiously designed to sort of continue to fail. I don't know, that's, that's my take on it. I don't know what everybody else is thinking, but I, it, I, what, what I'm seeing now is very disconcerting because it doesn't sound like a solution. It just feels like politics. I, you know, so I don't know if you, if you that, that could just be me ranting, but I'm, I'm very concerned. And, is, and so the question is $600 is clearly not enough. And I know that that supposedly is the first of many, or or, or, or or there's more to come. How soon is that? And so, I mean, what's the conversation like with, you know, the progressives in terms of, um, you know, providing more undergirding, you know, the economy in a stronger way? Yeah. No, absolutely. So, uh, initially, the stimulus checks, the payments were not included in the package that they were negotiating at all. It was supposedly a red line for Republicans. They said, no way. So the Congressional Progressive Caucus actually came out and said, we're going to vote against any package that does not include these. But we're calling them survival checks because that's what they are. We are past them being stimulus checks. They are just going to be enough for people to survive, which is an indictment in and of itself, right? We let the crisis get, get this bad. Um, and even with the relief to, to small businesses, I mean, the PPP 
they say it was a great success, but it was only supposed to cover, I think, 10 weeks, right? And then they expanded it to, to 12 and then 24. Um, and they tried to make all these modifications, but none of the modifications could make up for the fact that it just simply wasn't enough. So we're tinkering around the edges when people are facing financial ruin. Um, and so it is, you know, in some ways, Marianne, I think your, your cynicism is warranted. Um, McConnell and Senator McConnell on a call had had referred to sort of the, the race in Georgia as being part of the rationale for why something has to get done. So it is sort of a just enough to say you did something, but not really enough to fix the problem. And, and in a way, you know, moving forward, coming into a, a Biden administration, sort of what is the what is the conversation like then? What are, what are the dynamics then? What can actually be done? And so not even getting into that, it's like at this moment in time, this is not enough. And you know, progressives are making clear that it's that it's not enough. It's not enough to cover rent. Twelve hundred wasn't enough to cover rent in most in most places in the United States. There is just such a disconnect between what it costs people to to survive, let alone thrive, versus how much people feel like is appropriate to to quote unquote give away. And that's part of the problem, right? Feeling like these are handouts. They're they're not handouts, right? Everyone, everyone has paid into the system in one way or another. And at the end of the day, I mean, taking care of everyone that's just inherent in the social contract. If you want your society to, to be a place that you, you want to be a part of, then you have to ensure that people are okay. Like I don't, it's, it's not more complicated than that, but unfortunately um, for some folks, they have made the conversation seem like it's, it's about everything but that, but that central sort of truth. And then, you know, I, I just uh, took a seminar called the Op-Ed Project, which, you know, um, was a brilliant course and I recommend it for everybody if you have the opportunity and want more information about it, I'll put it in the, in the thing, in the um, chat. But um, one of the things that it, it talked, that we learned was right versus effective and, and confirmation bias and those kinds of things. And so in this conversation that we're having, you know, there's the progressives and, you know, and what we, what we, you know, are, are believe is are the right solutions. But then there's, you know, it's, it's, you know, Congress is a mixture of a lot of different kinds of, um, uh, you know, thoughts and philosophies. And so there's, so how do we, you know, what, what do you think is the, I don't know how to ask this question. You know, it, it seems like it, we've got a big challenge ahead of us. Um, the, the aligning the conversation between the progressives, the moderates, the, you know, the, the right wing, the QAnon, you know, the, it's just this wide, crazy. So how, how, do, how do we go about this? What's your, what are your, what are your thoughts about that? Um, well, I, I, you know, that's, um, it's a big question, Marianne. I, you know, and I think that it's one that that everyone is grappling with, right? We think this this election showed a lot of things about sort of the the state of our the social fabric holding us together, um, and how people feel about their neighbors. And you know, I, I don't know if if I personally have the answer. A congresswoman often says that you know we can't that in our efforts to, to compromise and, and to reach out to folks, that that can't be at, at the cost of our dignity, our safety, our liberation, right? And so it's a question of who, who can we work with to achieve the things that, that, we, want, that we want to achieve? Um, and I think that when people are out there and they're making demands, I mean, m members hear that and they see that, right? It's not, it's not like that we can't, push folks to, to take up our, our priorities. I mean, something like the Justice and Policing Act would never, I think, have made it to the floor, let alone be passed out of the house without the uprisings that we saw over, over the summer. And so there, there has to be that demonstration of, um, of people's support of um, you know, in, in some ways their, their anger that they truly are they are demanding a different kind of a change, a structural change that we don't want to, again, be sort of 
um, tinkering around around the edges that the, the problems that we're facing are structural. And so the solutions that we offer must be structural in nature too. Um, that, you know, these problems did not, it's not like we woke up one day and then things were, were bad. We, we let a lot of things deteriorate over several decades. We underfund things like USPS did not one day wake up and become insolvent, right? As, as some people would like to, to pretend was the case. There is, you know, there was legislation, there was policy, there were funding choices that were made that put that, uh, that agency in that position. And you see, and it's like that across, across the government. And so, you know, as the Congresswoman says, the only receipts that matter are budgets and, um, and, our, and our policy choices. And so if we've decided that, you know, Black Lives Matter, that, um, that the, the dignity and safety of all people matter, then the way that we go about policymaking needs to reflect that too. And so, you know, it really is just comes down to, to making noise. So again, individually to your representatives, as a business collective to, to you know, members more broadly, to, to leadership, folks need to feel like you are watching, you are paying attention, that you are keeping track of the decisions that people are, are making because so much of what happens sort of happens, I don't want, behind closed doors sounds insidi insidious, but it's not, not all debates are being ha had entirely out in the open. And I think that if there is a sense that you all as a community are very invested in, you know, progressive uh, policy, progressive economic policy and outcomes, then we start to see sort of a different approach approach from members. And you are just so uniquely positioned, I think, to make the case for why these, pro these good progressive policies are good for business too, which is good for everyone. Um, and you, the business communities often uses a reason not to do good things. We can't raise the minimum wage because it's bad for businesses. We can't, you know, have everyone have health insurance because it's bad for businesses. We can't mandate paid leave because it's bad for businesses. But you all can say, actually, we are businesses and we're saying this is a good thing. <laughs> well, that well, was a beautiful answer and the uh, transition for to introduce Thomas, who's going to talk about what ASBC is working on now and talk to us about um, what we can be supporting. And and uh, Aya, thank you so much and, and let uh, Congresswoman woman, Presley know that we're, we're a thousand percent behind her, but go ahead, Thomas, if you would. I, I was going to say among the, among the myriad reasons why I love working with Aya is, um, her ability to deliver great segues. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I, I, I could not have asked for a more perfect setup. I, let me, let me go back and make a couple of points regarding ASBC and, and, our ability to work with members of Congress, work with members at state legislatures to achieve change. Um, I, I think A.S. said it perfectly. Um, ASBC and its members, all of you, um, are uniquely positioned to speak to both sides. Uh, the, the power of the business voice um, is, is, is incredibly strong, particularly with policymakers who see business members as their constituents uh, as important constituents, and they listen. And whether they're Republicans or Democrats, progressives or conservatives, uh, business has a strong voice and a strong impact. The problem has been for too long, um, we've, been, we've been set up with this false choice that says healthy environment, healthy economy, pick one. Wrong. You know, the, the sign I keep referring to from the Youth strike, youth climate strike last year. There are no jobs on a dead planet. Um, the uh, you know we, we've business has been positioned. The voice of business has been taken over by the Chamber of Commerce and by the Manufacturers Association and by the Milton Friedman supporters who view everything in a very short term, uh, quarter to quarter, market close. Uh, it's it's all about what my stock price is takes nothing else into account. Doesn't matter what about the workers, doesn't matter about the community, doesn't matter what I do to the environment or the planet. All I care about is can I push my stock price up uh, another two or three cents. Um, and that's what this organization stands in opposition to. 
Um, the, the other thing I would say is uh, just, and I say this as somebody who was involved in electoral politics for a good bit of my career, um, one of the things that I think we need to do a better job of is recognize that the debate shifted. And so somehow ideas that, that have the support of vast majorities of the American people get perceived or, or labeled as socialist or radical or God forbid, progressive. Um, and in fact, you know, when two thirds of the people support you know, uh, a more progressive income tax that, that reflects on, on creating a more equitable society. Um, I'll note that UBS, hardly a socialist organization, did a study uh, in which they found that 2,200 billionaires around the, country, around the globe, 2,200 billionaires around the globe, not just in America, all over the globe, um, now control over $10 trillion in wealth. And that's grown in this year alone, in the midst of a global pandemic, they have increased that wealth by $1.5 trillion, which is, if, uh, if memory serves, about, uh, would have funded about half of HEROES, the HEROES Act, um, maybe, maybe a third, you know, but $1.5 trillion, while people are getting, you know, running the risk of laying awake every night, worrying about how they're going to put food on the table, how they're going to pay the rent. Um, that's not sustainable. That is simply not sustainable. And one of the things we need to do a better job of, and this is why um, people like Congresswoman Presley, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, Congressman Ilan Omar, who, you know, consistently reminds us of our humanity, but also pulls the debate back and says, wait, wait a second. You know, it, 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 we do need all of it. And we need people uh, on the progressive side, people on the left who are making the case so that the, you know, when it comes to the negotiation and we finally have to compromise, which is what all politics is, that compromise is truly closer to the center than it has been in a very long time. Because compromise, and I'm afraid that once again, we may be seeing a situation where Mitch McConnell gets 60% or 70% of what he wants and we get 30. Um, one, of the, one of the issues that we continue to push at ASBC and have pushed throughout, um, uh, we were certainly active in voicing our support for more direct loans or more direct grants, frankly, to business and to people, to workers. Um, uh, but one of the issues that, that I'm afraid uh, may get left off the table in this new round uh, is the extension of paid leave, um, uh, the emergency provisions that were in the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, one of the first bills that passed. Those emergency provisions were critically important and particularly critically important to women and to people of color who were uh, the most at risk in terms of um, not being able to work remotely, having to go to work and potentially expose themselves, uh, you know, having, having been uh, uh, disproportionately impacted by the virus itself. And so having more people to worry about to care for, including themselves. So uh, if Congress goes home without a paid leave provision, um, it will be a very, very sad day. And, and, millions, literally millions of people, particularly women, particularly people of color, will be the victims of, of that uh, uh, malfeasance. I, I think you can only call it a malfeasance. And it will, it will demand a very quick response after the first of the year if we don't get it um, before they go home uh, this week or this, this month, depending on what it takes. Um, uh, I'm going to sort of, uh, one of the things I did just as uh, uh, Christian Sanchez, uh, uh, my colleague at ASBC and I, um, and another and a third colleague, uh, did just sort of a, a, a search on uh, legislation in the, in, the, in the current Congress, which is about to end, um, on racial justice uh, and economic equity issues, um, and, and came back with, I, I think, um, my last count was over 60 different pieces of legislation, most of which did not pass. Um, so uh, going forward, 
uh, we're going to be looking for opportunities working with Aya and her colleagues uh, on, on trying to prioritize uh, all of our work through a lens of uh, racial justice and equity, um, whether it's you know the environment or economics or housing. Um, and I, uh, one of the things I'm, I'm particularly curious about and that we will be supporting, and I think we saw, as, as Marianne said, just how important the vote really is, uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, um, which I assume will be reintroduced as one of the first bills uh, in, the, in the new Congress. Um, it was interesting to me that uh, the Attorney General for the state of Texas, and I'm getting a little far afield here, but it, interesting to me that the Attorney General for the state of Texas had the audacity to file a suit and attempt to get the Supreme Court to overturn elections in four other states. Um, now, the state of Texas, very famously, along with many of the states that joined his suit, for years, for years, vociferously complained and finally got a conservative Supreme Court to eliminate one of the most important provisions in protecting Voting Rights Act. And that was the Section 5 preclearance provision in the original Voting Rights Act in 1965. And that provision required states to, uh, with the history of voter discrimination, required those states to pre-clear any voting changes, such as eliminating polling places. Geez, I wonder where I've heard that before. Uh, changing voting requirements, making, uh, you know, making it harder to vote, uh, changing the requirements to register to you know, things you had to have to show up at the polls, uh, like a voter ID. Um, uh, the, 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 frankly, the Southern states were the ones who were um, uh, it, it was not exclusively Southern states, but for the most part, the states of the, of the old Confederacy were the ones who were pretty much covered by that provision. That provision was eliminated by the Supreme Court uh, just a few years ago. And we have seen the atrocious, uh, uh, I, I would say, you know, anti-democratic, I, I can't think of all the words, all the awful words. We've seen how states consistently um, under the control of Republicans, largely, um, have attempted to, again, reduce the ability of people of color, in particular, uh, to vote, to participate. Uh, Stacey Abrams should be the governor of Georgia. Um, you know, uh, Andrew Gillum should be the governor of Florida. And the only reason they're not was because of uh, consistent and persistent efforts to eliminate uh, uh, certain people from having the ability to vote. Uh, it's, it seems crazy to me that, that you know, voting doesn't become automatic at 18. Uh, when you turn 18, you should get a voting card and every citizen should get a voting card. Um, it should be an automatic process. You ought to automatically register and automatically, you know, frankly, if it were up to me, I'd impose a fine for not voting. But, um, uh, but at any rate, so the Attorney General of Texas has the audacity after a history of, of you know, uh, almost uh, four decades of complaining about federal authority and federal interference in states' rights in elections, then, then goes around, turns around and files suit, um, you know, to try and overturn elections in other states because too many people of color voted. That was, that was what was really behind it. Um, uh, as I said, uh, at ASBC, we, we obviously, uh, this, this racial um, and equity, uh, race and equity working group, uh, I think is just one aspect of the kind of work that we're doing and, and will continue to do um, in 2021. And we look forward to working with Aya and others. Um, I, I will add one more thing. Um, one of the ways that we can make our voice heard is um, the e-blasts that you get from us asking you to sign on um, uh, to support efforts, whether it's the, the, um, the ending qualified immunity, which, uh, for which we, we I, I, as I recall, um, uh, we, we had actually several hundred people who signed on to support uh, Congresswoman Presley's bill to end qualified immunity and hold police officers accountable for when they, when they kill people uh, or, or injure them. Uh, they are not uh, they are essentially 
un completely unaccountable at, at the present time because of this qualified immunity that they have from uh, from being uh, held accountable for their actions. Um, so I know sometimes um, you know it may seem like we're we're kind of hounding you on on some of these e blasts and and go, coming after you on a regular basis, but it's really you know in order for our voice to be heard, it is important that. Uh, you participate in those efforts and that you sign on each of those letters for the most part when we send you those letters uh, we do it in a way that if you sign on from California um, uh, at your 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 letter your response will go to the two senators from California and the member of the house uh, who represents your zip code so if you're living in Congresswoman Presley's district in the seventh district of Massachusetts, um, your letter, if, if, you know, on qualified immunity, your letter would have gone to Senators Warren and Markey and to Congresswoman Presley, who obviously needed no persuasion on their her own bill, but, um, but that's the way the process works. And that's the way we can um, make sure that it's not just a blast to every member of Congress, you know, members of Congress get letters all the time. But as I'm sure Aya will support, uh, when she gets a letter or when the Congresswoman gets a letter from someone who lives in the seventh district of Massachusetts, that gets the attention uh, of, of that office. Um, they pay attention to their constituents. And so that's what we're asking you to do when we send you those e-blasts. Um, and, um, and so please, uh, to the extent you can both respond and, and if you have the ability to share with other networks, please do that as well. Because I think Marianne made this point earlier, uh, the US Chamber of Commerce claims to speak for business. What they really do is speak for corporate money. Um, we speak for the vast majority of businesses who are, um, who are good people, uh, who understand that they have a role in their community and that it's important that their communities survive and that their and that their patrons do well and that have enough money to buy their goods and services. You know, um, not a great guy, but Henry Ford did have this quote that I thought was smart. And that, you know, that was I want to I want he wanted to pay his workers enough that they could actually buy one of his cars. Seems like that makes sense to me. Um, anyway, I've, I've already talked too long, so Marianne, I'll toss it back to you. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, I think everybody has my email. Please uh, don't hesitate to contact me. And um, Aya, uh, just uh, we'll, be, we'll be in touch to talk about strategies and, and priorities. Um, Thomas, I'd just like to add on to that, um, the signatories. Um, when you... When you uh, hit submit, like Thomas said, it goes to your state rep or if you go to uh, whatever legislator um, or agency if you're going into regulations. Um, but in addition to the email <clears throat> that gets sent to them, um, you have the option to also tweet them if they have a um, Twitter account. So we set up a pre-worded um, pre tweet for you to use or you could use your own and then you can send it off to them. That's Kathleen Hutton. For those of you who may not know, that was Kathleen Hutton. Kathleen is our um, digital director. I refer to her as the digital queen of all uh, social media and web and she's great and uh, helps keep me straight. So I just want, I know that we're coming close to the end of the hour. I want to thank everybody for joining us and thank you to the ASBC team. You guys are phenomenal. Thomas, you, you're tireless and, and so passionate about what we do. And so thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom and knowledge um, with us. And I just want to also share with you that um, for those of you who are looking for something to do tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Eastern time, if you don't already, um, Andy Shalal, who is the founder of Bus Boys and Poets, Yay. right? And, and Andy is a is a is a like family to all of us. Um, you know, he ran for mayor of D.C. He has been a member of our sustainable business community and is just phenomenal in what he does. But every Friday, he does a Zoom dinner, and tomorrow's guest is um, what's her name, Jamila Priapal. 
the Congresswoman Pryprow, is that how you say her name? Anyway, so- That's well, yes. Right, okay. She's doing the Zoom dinner tomorrow and it's an hour of a conversation and they're always fabulous. And and um, Aya, I want you to talk to Ms. Presley. She needs to be on there with um, Andy because he gets like thousands. He now, his dinner is like, you know, two or 3,000 people turn out for it because that's how good they are. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So tune in tomorrow, watch it, um, get her attention. And then I'll love you that, you know, to, to Andy, that she needs to be on that show. Yeah, no, absolutely. If you can share the details, that'd be great. Okay, well, I I um, I just, I put the link to the event for tomorrow in the chat. So if you click on it, you just sign up for the show. And then once you're in there, we'll make sure you get connected to Andy. Okay, so with that said, um, we'll be back again next month. We'll send you details when we have our plan set and a speaker set. Aya, thank you again. And um, everybody have a wonderful weekend. Is there, Thomas, you, is there anything last, something you wanted to say before we go? Uh, just everybody have a great holiday season, uh, whatever holiday you're celebrating and make sure we are so close to a light at the end of this tunnel with the pandemic. Please make sure you socially distance wash your hands, wear a mask, do everything. Now is more important maybe than at any other time. We are so close uh, to, to saving more people. Um, so please, please just be careful out there. Be safe, healthy, and have a great holiday season. And reach out if you need anything at all. All right. Thank Bye. you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right.